lawyers uh, in Italy. Uh, so uh, it's uh, very generous uh, of her that uh, she took the time uh, to uh, join us uh, tonight and contribute to the indo Dutch Cybersecurity School. Uh, I see uh, some students already expressing their excitement in the chat. Uh, so I started the recording. Um, afterwards, uh, after the introduction, uh, Benedetta will uh, deliver her expert lecture on GDPR and uh, she was also kind enough to open herself uh, to a short Q&A session after the lecture. So as usual, feel free to drop your observations, questions, uh, whatever you're interested in uh, about the topic of cyber law GDPR in the chat. As usual, I enabled the chat um, for uh, uh, for this lecture also, and uh, I'll be moderating the uh, Q and A session uh, at the end. Uh, now it's uh, 4 p.m. here and 8:30 in India. Uh, so let me begin uh, by uh, introducing uh, Benedetta. Uh, thank you so much again for uh, being here. Uh, Benedetta is a civil lawyer uh, with 27 years of experience and a uh, certified data protection officer uh, with a specialization in information security, uh, smart contracts and blockchain. Uh, Benedetta is also a, a senior lecturer of uh, European business law and uh, GDPR, international law and ethics and moot court course at the, the Swiss School of Management in Rome. Uh, for the past two years, uh, since 2020, Benedetta has been part of the Legal Hackers Group in Rome. Uh, she's a co-founder of uh, the Natalian Podesta law firm. And uh, in the capacity of DPO, uh, Benedetta is also responsible for educating a company's employees about uh, data compliance, training members of staff uh, who are involved uh, in processing data and uh, uh, carrying out uh, various uh, risk assessments and uh, regular uh, security audits. Um, with that, uh, Benedetta, uh, I would like to yield the floor to you. I uh, made you a presenter, uh, so uh, you're on the spotlight for everyone. And uh, with that, uh, uh, I believe we may begin the lecture. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much. I'm excited as well uh, to give this lecture because uh, as I was, uh, uh, yeah, we, we had a, a, a small talk with uh, Adam and I was saying that I'm really excited to, to meet uh, uh, this very international environment. I mean, it's an Indo-Dutch plus also Italian since I'm based in Rome. So uh, <laughs> it's really an international environment and I'm so excited to give my lecture. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to share my screen because I have some slides. Um, so. Um, I hope I will be successful in this. So, uh, just a couple of minutes. And I hope it will be okay. It's downloading. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, meanwhile, so I want to say that uh, I will talk about what uh, is basically my cup of tea. So what I do uh, every day, uh, as uh, Adam said, I, I'm a DPO and I work with uh, cybersecurity and risk management uh, uh, Yeah, uh, in my everyday life. So this is more or less the uh, uh, kind of lecture I, I want to give you. So just a couple of words about uh, um, the GDPR and yeah, so I, I think uh, it should be visible, but yeah, is it in presentation mode? Uh, yes, uh, it's visible. Um, okay. Uh, works perfectly. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, I just uh, introduce uh, 
introduce this. Uh, uh, is it okay? Uh, fifth annual online Indo Dutch cybersecurity school. So here you can find my brand, so Legal Hackers of Rome, Swiss School of Management, and Natalia Podestalo firm. So just, uh, just to mention uh, what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about, of course, uh, uh, privacy, but I think uh, you all know, uh, sorry, I, I, okay, I was too fast. So uh, I'm starting to talk about uh, privacy because it is connected to the GDPR, which is the European Regulation on Data Protection. So we start by indicating uh, the features of, uh, of privacy. So consider that at the end of, uh, at the center of privacy, there is the individual, the natural person. So why protecting personal data? Because data need to be disclosed. And uh, of course, this implies also uh, the necessity to, to protect uh, data which are disclosed. Uh, this principle, which keeps the individual at the center of such protection, is stated by uh, a number of uh, regulations, which are uh, of an international environment, but also national environment. I mean, uh, so at an international level, we can say that uh, there are conventions also for the United Nations, the European Charter, uh, also supervisory opinion, uh, around the necessity to protect personal data because they are part of human rights, because personal data involve human rights. So uh, what is also important to do is also to connect the various kinds of regulation to a sort of a common ground, which is, as I said, uh, avoiding that a violation of uh, uh, personal data can be enacted when such data are disclosed. So moving on to the next slide. This is what we have in Europe. So uh, as you know, um, so let's say that, uh, uh, let me go somewhat uh, behind this uh, uh, general data protection, protection regulation. So the European Union was created as a common market. So we are now 27 states, 27 countries uh, after Brexit, we, we were 28. Uh, but the creation of European Union was uh, on the ground of creating a free market where people, capital, services uh, and persons were allowed, are allowed to move as freely as in the national environment which means also creating a sort of standard policy over certain aspects. Um, so uh, towards this kind of uh, aspects, such as uh, in this case, uh, uh, data protection, the European Union considers itself a supranational organization. So which means that the regulation such as the GDPR is directly binding and effective, and effective over all the European countries. So also taking the precedence over the national regulations. So we had before a directive, before the creation of uh, the European Union. Uh, and of course, this directive has been replaced and overcome by the GDPR, uh, which was adopted, you can read it easily, on 14 April 2016 and became enforceable uh, on 25 of May uh, 2018. What is the characteristic and the primary aim of the GDPR? The GDPR is aimed to protect, I was uh, saying that just uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, this lecture, um, also to protect, of course, uh, 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 the individual, but also to simplify the regulatory environment. So what Europe does is to create over certain elements of uh, our, let's say, life together. I, 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 I regarding the 27, the 27 countries, creating a kind of standard policy, standardization policy, because it is more simple. I mean, 
the European countries that are put together do not have uh, so many elements in common. We are, we have different backgrounds, we have a diff different history. So, in order to, uh, to create a common regulation over important topics, uh, the standard policy is indeed the best and, of course, easier solution. So, the GDPR uh, is more or less aimed to simplify the, regula the regulatory environment. Because, uh, uh, of course, um, let's say uh, uh, human rights are at stake, but also the relationship with third countries is at stake. So the GDPR protects European citizens, but also is effective outside the uh, boundaries of the European Union. Uh, because sometimes, you know, it happens that data are processed outside the European Union, but the data are referred to a natural person that is a European citizen. In this case, the GDPR is applicable. In this case, the effectiveness of the GDPR becomes wider than the Schengen area. So, it becomes something that is effective also outside the, uh, let's say, the territory of the European Union. Here I have, uh, let's say, a very, very small, a very easy example. So we have, if you if you look at uh, uh, the image, you have the data subjects, and of course, personal data are disclosed and transferred to a controller uh, through the mechanism of the consent. So we will see that the mechanism of the consent is mandatory in order to allow the controller to retain, to keep personal data uh, and to store them. So, of course, the controller is most of the times based uh, in the European Union, but sometimes the processor, which can be uh, the IT system uh, that processes personal data uh, stored by the controller could also be not based in the European Union. So the relation between the controller and the processor takes place through a contract. Uh, and the processor becomes responsible for processing data that are transferred to the contract by the controller. In this case, the processor, even though based outside the European Union, has to respect uh, the regulations set out by the GDPR because the data are referred to a European citizen. So, moving on to the basis of processing data according to the GDPR and why it's not working. Okay. So, lawful, fair and transparent processing. So, these are insights and, and, and uh, let's say, rules that uh, uh, has to, uh, have to be followed uh, by, uh, by processing personal data. So, processing personal data has to be lawful, fair and transparent with a purpose limitation. So, only for the reasons that allowed the data retention, only for that reason. Data minimalization, I will explain, of course, accurate and up-to-date processing, limitation of storage in forms that permit identification. So it means that uh, every time that you uh, let's say, transfer your personal data to the controller, then, then the controller uh, passes the data to the processor. Uh, it must be not really easy to identify data. So you have to limit the storage in forms that are so direct that uh, allow the data to be immediately disclosed. And for those reasons, uh, techniques like pseudonymization, encryption are used in order to avoid that. 
confidential and secure, and respectful of the principles of accountability and liability. So, well, of course, uh, uh, data controllers um, are responsible for, of course, uh, storing and, uh, yeah, let's say also processing data. Sometimes uh, they must disclose any data collection. They must declare the local basis and purpose for data processing. State also how long data are retained and verify whether data are shared with any third parties or outside the European uh, Union area. Because outside the European Union area, rules might be different. Even though, let's say that at an international level, uh, the various countries are more or less in line with the GDPR. So, uh, of course, we have issues, um, for instance, with the USA. Now there is a, a problem with uh, Google Analytics uh, that of course, uh, it is uh, so it, when you uh, click on the cookies, uh, selection of cookies that you have to accept, and you have Google Analytics. Okay, Google Analytics has been declared not really uh, lawful by the GDPR. So uh, now there are issues whether it's illegal or not. Uh, it appears that Google Analytics 4 is acceptable, but now I don't want to bother you with this, uh, technical matters. But I mean, this is something that implies is that sometimes the rules cannot be, re be really uniform uh, uh, in third countries. But under the GDPR, what is really important is the way that uh, uh, so the, the, the processing data is conducted and the basis of processing data, which means that uh, uh, data processing has to be lawful, fair and transparent, which means the legal basis uh, that allow, you know, processing data. Um, with the purpose limitation, so personal data may be only collected for specified, explicit, which means very clear and legitimate purposes. These are the legal basis which are determined at the moment of collection. Uh, if you have an undefined or unlimited storage of data, this is unlawful. And personal data must only be processed in a manner that is compatible with those purposes. Otherwise, it is required to sign a, a consent on different legal basis. Uh, I was also mentioning minimalizing data. So uh, the, this principle refers to the duty to process personal data only when it is adequate. So only when it is appropriate, relevant, which means pertinent and limited to what is necessary for the purposes for which they are processed, not excessive. They do not have to exceed the purpose. To limit the storage of personal data to a strict minimum, this is data minimalization, which means also to establish time limits to delete data or to have periodic reviews in order to assess what should be erased. Uh, which is also connected to the right to be forgotten. Uh, also, um, the assessment uh, regarding the need to process personal data uh, is a sort of, uh, um, let's say, uh, economy, you know, of processing personal data. You know, it means uh, that it becomes uh, easier, you know, to uh, take into account what you are storing, what you are processing, if, you know, uh, uh, let's say that the data you have are minimalized. This is part of integrity. And this is also uh, compliance of the principle of accountability, which I, of course I, I'm going to explain later. 
uh, that is at the basis of uh, the GDPR. So I will talk about the principle of accountability, privacy by design and privacy by default. Well, what is personal data? It's any information of any kind, which means uh, uh, my name is, I was born in, my address is, but also my sexual orientation. The thing is that it is related to an individual. So, uh, as I was uh, introducing, it has an impact. Also, according to the personal data that you are disclosing. Why? Because all those information render the individual identified or identifiable. Which means also having consequences. If you profess a certain religion, a certain sexual orientation, uh, if you, uh, let's say, your bank account is disclosed, so this might have an impact. Also, having online identifier or location data, this is also something that commonly happens. Every time that you click on some applications in order to, uh, yeah, to, uh, to locate you, also this is something that gives an information about you, which is also very delicate and important. So, a number of uh, elements, even though data are different. So, um, there are, uh, let's say, data of different kinds. So, personal data are something that uh, uh, are able to identify certain characteristics or information related to the person. But there are some data that are even more delicate. They are called sensitive personal data and they include special categories. And those special categories must be treated with extra security. Why? Because those informations include racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, also trade union membership, genetic data, data related to sexual life or orientation of a person and biometric data. Do you remember during pandemic times, so these are biometric data, when your temperature was scanned? There were scanners, airports or uh, shops or whatsoever. There were devices and your uh, body temperature was scanned. This is processing data. This is processing biometric data. And of course, what is happening now, I think uh, it happens everywhere, we have applications, uh, at least we do, well, I, I mean, so I, I mean it, it is something that uh, it, it, it's becoming really international. We have applications uh, connected to the public health care service. And in these applications, we have our uh, clinical history. So also if we do analysis or whatsoever. So this is online medicine and of course includes even more the necessity of protecting our personal data. Because what happens is that, and this is something that is not included in the slides, but it's an extra information. But maybe you wonder why, I think you know, because uh, uh, I don't think you're new about this topic, but maybe you wonder why it is so important to protect this personal data. Because data are really interesting for certain categories of criminals, cyber criminals. They are really interesting because they are sold. There is a trait that uh, uh, takes place uh, in the dark web, of course, if you imagine the web, you know, uh, there is an image that you can find also uh, online in the internet. It's an iceberg. So in this iceberg, you have the surface, and in this surface, you have, uh, let's say, the web that we all know, which means uh, 
Google, uh, which means uh, um, uh, uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatsoever. Then you have uh, a deeper layers of this iceberg. So it is the deep web. And in the deep web, you find the uh, intranet systems, you find all these applications rela uh, related to uh, governmental control of your public health security systems or uh, whatsoever, bank accounts, uh, something that is more personal to you. But it is still, of course, it is still legal. And then there is the dark web. So the dark web is the one that is, uh, uh, of course, it doesn't have a direct and easy access, let's say, and there you can find anonymous, the Silk Road, so cybercrime, you know. Uh, so, and so th th there are, there is a trade of, yeah, million and billion of uh, cryptocurrencies, because of course, uh, cyber criminals use cryptocurrency in order to obtain what they want. So, this is why uh, our data are so important, no matter what, but of course, uh, even more when those data are sensible. So, uh, moving on, of course, then I will answer to all your questions. The data subjects have some rights, uh, and these rights have to be exercised in order to protect your interests. Right to be informed about my, my data, right to access to my data anytime, to rectif uh, rectification of data if I had to change something, right to erasure and the right to be forgotten, uh, restriction of processing. Uh, I have to be notified every time that uh, my data are processed uh, because, as I said, the legal basis cannot really avoid, so has to be done in line with the consent of the natural person that is the data subject. Data portability, so to transfer data, to object, so to say, okay, well, no. Um, also, uh, to minimize the automated decision making and other uh, issues and, and features. Well, I was mentioning the principle of privacy by design and privacy by default. This is uh, one of the core, core uh, issue, uh, features of uh, the GDPR. So, which means that the GDPR tries to design data protection around the individual by allowing data processing only through uh, by respecting some uh, specific principles. So companies are encouraged to implement all the technical and organizational measures that allow a fair and lawful treatment of, uh, of personal data. And also to take into control what is the uh, processing data by default. By default, which means uh, uh, through, let's say, uh, technical devices, so something that you cannot uh, decide in advance because, uh, as I said, it happens by default and I have the examples. So, what is data protection by design? For instance, the use of pseudonymization. You replace personally identifiable material with artificial identifiers and encryption in coded messages. So you don't have a direct access to the information related to the individual. But this is something that you can do only if you have the possibility to act on processing data. But sometimes if you use a, a social media platform, this is something that you cannot do. So it, maybe uh, you know that uh, uh, on Facebook or social media, there are some applications that uh, are also quite quite silly. Uh, they say, okay, well, uh, who is your guardian angel? And you click on this, <laughs> they immediately copy your data and they give you the response. This is a typical 
processing data by default. You really can do anything. So social media platform uh, have to, should, because not all the times they do that, a sort of a, a privacy compliant and friendly setting by. So how? Limitation of uh, from the start uh, of the to the accessibility of the user's profile, but this is something that uh, not very frequently happens. Most of the times, if you download an app and uh, of course you click on uh, uh, sharing, you know your data and information. This is something that by default you hope that the application is respectful of these principles. So this is why sometimes you you have. Uh, 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 news about uh, the various apps that are not respectful, you know, of uh, of the principles. Well, let's say that uh, the privacy by design uh, follow uh, a very important principle, which is uh, the principle of accountability, and it means that. There are six uh, lawful bases specified by the regulation that allow processing data. I already mentioned the consent. I also already mentioned the contracts between the controller and the processor. The public task allow, of course, uh, personal uh, uh, processing personal data, vital interest, legitimate interest and legal requirements. So these are the six bases that allow, of course, uh, uh, it is not necessary that they coexist, but they are the six bases that allow processing data. Well, so I don't think uh, you really need to know uh, what is the controller and the processor, but I mean, I, I already explained, so controller stores data and determines how data will be processed, and the processor is a third party, any third party. What is basically the difference? The controller has an overall general responsibility for processing data and liability for violation of, uh, of data uh, processing. The processor is only responsible for the specific portion of data processing that is uh, transferred to him through the contract. And that's it. Well, so here we go. Responsibilities of the data controller that are really not are set out by the Article 24 of the GDPR. And Article 24 mentions very important principles, which are, of course, uh, around the idea of risk. Processing data implies risk. And how can you uh, limit, you know, uh, the risk? By enacting appropriate technical and organizational measures in order not only to ensure, but also to be able to demonstrate that you are carrying out uh, data processing in accordance with the regulation. So, well, here we go again to the controller and the processor. Again, pseudonymization. So, you store data, and of course, uh, you transform personal data, so they cannot be attributed to a specific subject. The record of processing activity, which most of the times is done by data protection officer. Enacting the security of personal data through specific as I said, technical and organizational measures, and implement measures, if you can, with the principles of uh, data protection. So, this is something that, of course, uh, now you might wonder, well, so what does it mean in general? 
what is GDPR compliance? Because uh, I already I, I only mentioned the relation between the individual and the controller and the processor. But who is the controller? Of course, the controller is most of the times the company or an organization that is interesting, interested in, you know, storing your data. So uh, the GDPR and all the measures enacted by the, and recommended by the GDPR are uh, obviously enacted by large enterprises. But the issue is, is where it's with uh, small and medium enterprise. So uh, it means that uh, you, you might find small and medium enterprises which are not really compliant with the regulation. So enacting all these technical and organizational measures in order to protect personal data that you are storing has a cost. Of course, it's not for free because all the tools that are uh, can imply also uh, hiring a DPO or um, I don't know, uh, let's say during the risk assessment or uh, assessing the privacy, uh, a privacy record with a risk assessment and uh, that I will talk about uh, is not really for free, can be expensive. So small, medium enterprises, most of the time small enterprises or small organizations, sometimes they do not really, uh, they don't appear to be compliant. So uh, it, it means that uh, they uh, rely on uh, quite uh, old dated systems. Uh, also, they lack in the formation of uh, employees and personnel that they will be uh, uh, aware of what is happening. Uh, and this is a problem because, uh, of course, uh, uh, so there are some organizations that uh, store personal data, and sometimes those personal data are not uh, uh, fully uh, protected. So this is uh, uh, what, what is a large enterprise, how a large enterprise is uh, uh, considered to be. So uh, uh, mm, it means that a large portion of enterprises is not really compliant. But still, the data controller has to protect privacy rights. And the principle of accountability that I was mentioning, of course, rely on the basic principles that we, uh, of course, mentioned before. Um, what does it mean uh, enacting the technical and organizational measures in order to be compliant? Sometimes it involves the choice of the DPO. It's an opportunity, of course it's not an obligation, but of course having a DPO with competences and skills uh, can help uh, a company to be compliant and to follow the principles of the GDPR. The data processing register, according to Article 30, Paragraph 5, is it obligatory for small, medium enterprises? The answer is, it depends. It depends on the kind of data that you are storing and processing. It means staff training. So sometimes employees are not really informed about, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the rules are set out by the GDPR, not all the times. And this is something that is a really a critical issue, issues of, uh, that we are facing. Protecting personal data is a tool for freedom and evolution. Now we wonder, is it a burden or is it an evolution? Well, So these are the fines that are applicable in case of data breach. Of course, now it is up to you to uh, consider if, if uh, you know, uh, being compliant with the GDPR can be considered uh, 
an extra cost or whether it is something that uh, should become uh, since it is necessary uh, should be implemented so uh, if you can uh, if you record a data breach to the national supervisory authority which is something that you can do 72 hours uh, from so the uh, notification of uh, a violation of the personal data, you can be fined up to 20 million euros or up to 4% of the annual worldwide turnover of the preceding financial year, which is a really, which is really a lot. So, sometimes, uh, companies wonder, do I really need a DPO? Well, let's try to give you an answer, because uh, of course uh, the data controller has an obligation to appoint the data protection officer, not all the times, but only in case that uh, the data controller is a public entity or if it's a public or a private entity which uh, carries out activities involved, uh, involving regular and systematic monitoring of interests on a large scale. Or if it is a public or a private entity that as a main activity, as a core activity, carries out uh, or involves particular data and or judicial data on a larger scale. So here you can find that what is at stake is on one hand the kind of data that the controller is processing and storing. And on the other hand, the idea of large scale. So what does it mean? So if you are a small or a medium enterprise, of course you might say, okay, well, I'm completely fine because uh, I'm a small enterprise, so I do not process data on a large scale. So I'm safe. And this is the trick. Because the GDPR doesn't give a proper definition, does not quantify what is the idea of large scale? What is the concept of large scale? There is no definition. So you can find something on recital number 91, which says large scale processing, which aims at the processing of a significant amount of personal data at a regional, national or supranational level, and which could affect a large number of data subjects and potentially uh, present a high risk. What does it mean? So this is what I <laughs> define as a sort of legal language, because it is a general, can be applied to uh, an undefined uh, number or, or kind of situation, but it's not really precise. So, significant amount. Regarding what? So this is not a general statement. This is not an indication. This is something that um, offers the ground for interpretation on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's it. It is clear. So let's say that you are a private investigator. A private investigator is not really a company. It's a professional organization. But can you imagine the kind of data that are processed in this kind of environment? So interests that are involved considering, I don't know, information regarding uh, the economical situation of a person or if this person is cheating on the uh, husband or the wife or whatsoever. So you can imagine that uh, if those data are stored in an appropriate, in a not appropriate way, 
uh, yeah, problems can be really a lot. So the DPO is a service. Uh, sorry, I was uh, going too fast. Because the DPO supports uh, this data processing. So what we do as DPOs is trying to increase awareness of, uh, uh, let's say, people involved in data processing, such as the controller, such as the processor, such as the employees on the also. Uh, also, what we should do is to uh, uh, safeguard the formation of uh, the awareness, let's say, of, uh, uh, of people involved in data processing. Um, and also to verify if the GDPR is enacted and implemented through periodic uh, audits and uh, yeah, meetings. So uh, the DPO is a tool of accountability. Uh, also, um, I'm trying to, uh, to introduce what is a, a really a very important topic regarding GDPR which is uh, assessment and risk-based approach. Well, we can say that we go back to the technical and organizational security measures. And they are all uh, around uh, the risk-based approach. So, um, when I mentioned the technical and organizational measures, well, they are a lot. Organizational measures can be also hiring the DPO, forming the employees, uh, setting out the uh, register for privacy, uh, for, for privacy uh, data processing. Uh, also uh, a system of audit. The technical measures sometimes are really simple, but believe me, not all the times they are inactive. So the backup system should be something really evident, but sometimes there is a, so it's not systematic. Tracking. Tracking, this is also very simple. Tracking access to computer program and systems. So managing access permissions. Sometimes I do not find any kind of uh, indication uh, in this direction. And encryption is something really technical, but of course uh, it is uh, in line with the uh, possibly with with the possibility of uh, yeah with the purpose of uh, limiting direct access to personal information. Also including closed service contracts. So certifications and periodic internal audits to verify whether the application of internal procedures and their adequacy are enacted. So what is encryption? What is a pseudonymization? So, of course, it is, uh, in case of cryptography, replacing uh, something that is a sort of extended, clear, direct, directly um, accessible information through uh, some signs. Also, uh, sometimes you can, uh, maybe you can, uh, you can remember that uh, uh, if you are recommended to change your password, also there are indications about the password you have to choose. So not all the times you have to insert only uh, letters, but also numbers and also signs, uh, different signs. Uh, can be a comma, can be a, a uh, let's say uh, brackets or whatsoever. Pseudonymization 
and anonymization uh, are also yeah, something that uh, transforms in some ways the personal information. So with the pseudonymization, also you have, uh, uh, let's say the personal information is transformed, so pseudonymized, but differently from the uh, anonymization, you, you have a key access. And only the person that is in process of the key access through uh, uh, a system uh, of authentication uh, has the possibility to uh, recollect the personal extended information. In case of uh, anonymization, the process is irreversible. So it means that it is extremely difficult to recollect. It's not impossible, but it is even more difficult to recollect the, uh, uh, let's say, extended and direct information. So, uh, all these technical and organizational measures are run around the the idea, the concept of risk. So we go back to what I was mentioned. Processing data imply the risk, expose risk, the risk to be violated, the risk that uh, personal data are violated and uh, in case of breach and in case that you as controller are not fulfilled, for, uh, are not fulfilling uh, the regulation enacted by the GDPR. Uh, so in this case, uh, if you are exposed, um, you have to also find out the area of necessary and or urgent intervention. Also to adopt the corrective measures and to access the current state of implementation of security measure, if those measures are effective, if you apply it in, in the most appropriate way, uh, all the, uh, uh, let's say, the technical and organizational measures uh, that we mentioned a number of times, and in the end, if you are compliant with the GDPR. But what is the risk? First of all, never confuse the risk with the threat. Because the threat or hazard indicates what is the source of danger. But the risk is the likelihood that the threat will occur. So here you have three elements. You have the risk, you have the hazard, and you have vulnerability. All of these are referred to the data processing, to the way you are storing and or processing data. If there is, of course, uh, if the hazard is a really high, which means that there is a high source of danger, and the source of danger is not only determined by a cyber attack, it is also determined by the way you are protecting your data. So do not consider that the hazard is only created by something that is external, because maybe it depends also on you and on the way you are protecting or not protecting data. This, of course, increase the risk that your data are violated. And also it means that your system is vulnerable. So uh, these are elements that are all connecting together. And if the hazard is high, also the risk is high and the, the vulnerability becomes even higher. And also the other way around. What is the private privacy impact assessment? So, this is something that, or PIA, it's a risk analysis. Uh, of course, it is not something that is made 
like this. There is a tool, various tools. Uh, one of the most uh, uh, important, uh, one of the most uh, 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 yeah, uh, common uh, tools is uh, um, licensed by ENISA. And it allows you to do an assessment of the way you are processing data. It was introduced uh, uh, with uh, GDPR, Article 35, and it's technically uh, an analytical record on the way you are processing, organizing uh, your data. Also, assessing if you are compliant with the GDPR and if you are enacting all the technical and organizational measures. So if you are accountable. So let's say that uh, uh, you introduce uh, what, is, what is the kind of your activity, uh, the name of the controller, uh, the name of the processor or processors, if there are more than one, the kind of data you are uh, storing and processing. Uh, so to whom did those data can be disclosed? The way you are protecting them. So there are a number of informations. And of course, uh, this implies also calculating what is the level of risk, vulnerability, and threat. Why do I have to perform a privacy impact assessment? First of all, because in this way, you are compliant with the GDPR. And you also are able to demonstrate that you are compliant with the GDPR. Also, if there is something that is not really fulfilling, fulfilling the GDPR, you can identify if your system is weak. And you can prevent that something occurs to the system and data are disclosed and violated. It means also that, yeah, of course, uh, implementing uh, those technical and organizational measures is costly, is expensive, but running the risk of a violation and of a fine, of a sanction, maybe you remember the amount, the possible amount of the fine, avoids the cost of uh, uh, the consequences and also the reputational uh, uh, risk. So why do I have to perform this private privacy impact assessment? Also because in this way you can obtain evidence of what is happening to you. So you reduce uh, also the negative impact of your, uh, yeah, of your reputation in case of data breach. Because of course, uh, even though you are implementing all the measures, even though you are completely accountable, so you are the, the typical example, example of the principle of accountability. You are totally compliant with GDPR. But if there is a very skilled hacker which uh, uh, breaks up into your system and uh, of course violates your data, you cannot really <laughs> do anything. It doesn't depend on you. What depends on you is to demonstrate in case that there is a notification to the uh, privacy authority that the violation has been enacted, has, uh, is taking place, that you did everything you could in order to protect your data, which includes, of course, uh, encryption, pseudonymization, and whatsoever. And as I said, you're also able to demonstrate it. So, what is the result of uh, the privacy impact assessment? The level of hazard and the level of impact. So, this is the result. So, you have a sort of uh, a uh, table, a scheme, uh, where you have the likelihood level that, uh, of course, the, the hazard will take place and the level. So it means that uh, if, uh, uh, let's say, the level is serious, we have to enact all the corrective measures in order to reduce the risk, or also if it is high, 
If it is low or middle, you are allowed to proceed the way you are. You are, uh, uh, of course, you do. So, uh, just a couple of things. The level of hazard of threat is, of course, related to the way you are processing it. But the way you are processing data, which of course implies the risk, has an impact. And the impact is something that can have detrimental consequences on data subjects. So this is uh, what you have to consider. So uh, the data subject, which is uh, the individual that has the right yeah, to, uh, to, to, to see that, to, to, to know that uh, his personal data are protected. So, GDPR, uh, there are of course more benefits than concerns, but indeed there are some legitimate concerns. First of all, and this is something that uh, I want to already say, it is not really a flexible regulation. It is quite strict. The sanctions are, you remember, quite high. Also, in case of uh, violation, the negative impact on the company's image is really high. And this is a cost. Uh, so, as I said, for small enterprises, it's not really easy. But there are benefits. So, uh, increased security of the data managed by the company, of course, also counteracts to the illegal traffic of information. Streamlining of business processes to boost their effect for investors and partners, because, of course, uh, you improve you know, the image of the company. The company is protected, so it is a safe company. And, of course, some extra benefits because, of course, there are some uh, uh, yeah, uh, information related to the company which are protected as well. Also, all the rights related to intellectual property. So, security regulations are, have a really wide impact. So, uh, I think that uh, taking into account, uh, the, let's say, the negative aspect, which I was uh, explaining, is more or less related to the cost of implementing, you know, the uh, GDPR technical and organizational measures. I think that uh, a very wide campaign in order to improve, uh, uh, to, to, to improve uh, the formation and information of employees should be really enacted. Thank you so Thank much, you so much. Uh, Bernadette. Uh, Bernadette. Uh, uh, I really uh, have a full uh, 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 lecture, uh, uh, lecture uh, 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 um, <laughs> There seems to be a bit of an echo uh, uh, on uh, one of our sites. Uh, I will try to uh, sort it out in After Effects. Um, a lot of students uh, asked you questions um, yeah. uh, during the lecture. Uh, you've already been really generous with your time. Uh, so yeah. let me just address a couple of them, if that's OK. OK, so I'm reading some questions on the, on the chat. Uh, yes, oh, the chat is visible to you. Great. Yeah. I believe the first one so is from Tom. I, I'm reading something about the cryptocurrencies. So uh, we have. Uh, let me say that, uh, so if, if we have to talk about cryptocurrency, uh, yeah, well, um, I think it's a, it's a very wide uh, topic, but let me say something. So uh, I will try to give you a more, quite a general answer. I hope that uh, I will answer also this question. So we all know that uh, there is an increase in employment of blockchain technology in, in, in a number of fields. And of course, the blockchain technology is moved. Uh, uh, so in order to, to work, 
let's say, employs uh, uh, cryptocurrency uh, like Ethereum or whatsoever. But the thing is that sometimes employing uh, moving the blockchain technology uh, as an impact because, uh, of course, uh, it also and the impact is related to the consumption. So uh, we can say that uh, what do I think about uh, employing those platforms? Um, I think that uh, the benefits are, so I, I believe that benefits are quite high. Uh, also, let's say that uh, the blockchain technology uh, employs also, uh, so uh, part of the blockchain technology uh, in, involves uh, issues like the token, the smart contracts and whatsoever. I, I try to be short. And this is something that has a, has a really wide uh, employment. Sometimes the system, as I said, is not flexible because, um, uh, so let's say that uh, uh, all uh, uh, the nodes participating to the, to the blockchain have to, uh, cannot really change. So the blocks are something that uh, uh, cannot really be uh, cannot really move, you know, through uh, uh, or, or uh, increasing uh, in order to uh, change some elements. So if you have to change some elements and you are not really unanimous in order to, to reach uh, uh, the accordance, uh, of course, in this case, uh, you have to create a new blockchain technology and move everything. Uh, so it's not really uh, easy. Uh, I have now, I read another question. The GDPR is a way to protect the data of individuals within the European Union. The rules within the European Union are more strict than, for example, yeah, it is true. That being said, Facebook wanted to build an extremely big data center in the Netherlands. Do you know why Facebook would want to have a big data center in a European member state? given the fact that they have to comply. Because in this way, so if you, uh, so of course it has to be compliant, but in this case, it would be even more, it would be easy for him for, let's say for Facebook to, uh, uh, to sell or to share his products let's call them products, with European citizens. In this way, uh, setting out uh, um, a data center in Europe means that it, it, it will be treated as a sort of subsidiary. And the subsidiary is subject to the European regulation. So in this case, it is true that uh, if uh, the data center is based in the Netherlands, it is true that the data center has to follow the European regulation. But it is also true that in this case, it becomes free to act within the European Union. So pro uh, I already mentioned that uh, there are problems in uh, uh, disclosing data towards third countries, because of course the level of protection could be different. So the example of Google Analytics is one of, is one of the many examples that I could do. Uh, if you set, of course, uh, uh, let's say, if you, if you place your, your, fo your, your foot uh, uh, within the territory of, of the European Union, uh, of course, uh, you can, uh, you are subject to the European regulation, but you can also provide more easily your products to uh, uh, in Europe. Will the European Union adopt blockchain technology since most of the smart contracts and other applications be there very little or no, no personal? So, uh, smart contracts are employed, but they are not yet considered as being complete contracts for the reason that I was mentioning before. Uh, so uh, the contract 
is one of the most flexible instrument we have. So parties are really uh, independent and autonomous in, uh, let's say, setting up the elements of the contract, of course, if they are, uh, if they are uh, lawful. Uh, but they can also change some elements through the basis of uh, a common ground of a common consent. This is something that you cannot do with a smart contract because a smart contract being part of uh, the blockchain technology and of course uh, uh, yeah you know that uh, uh, through the blockchain technology of course you cannot really change or act in the way you can do physically with a contract so you are part of a of a mechanism uh, so um, they are employed for certain parts, let's say in trade can be employed if you have to, uh, yeah, for commercial purposes, they are uh, more or less employed, but not really in a general way, and they are not considered as a complete contract. According to the European GDPR, if any organization provides goods or services to Europe's citizens or residents, the European GDPR applies to you even if the organization yeah, is not located So, um, the problem is not whether where the company is located. The problem is whether the company processes personal data of a European citizen. If the company is able to process, for certain reasons, personal data of a European citizen, in this case, the company has to follow the rules of the GDPR. What about European companies based in you that process the personal data of citizens from other countries, such as Indian or Russian citizens? It is the other way around. So uh, the European Union is uh, based on the principle of mutual recognition. So it means that uh, if there is something that is allowed in Europe, this is something that should be also uh, allowed uh, on the other way around. But of course, if uh, uh, so, let's say that what is important is the personal data that is processed and the regulation that is applied to the individual. So in this case, if the individual is based outside uh, the European Union, of course, uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, the, the European organization has to take into account the regulation of the country where the individual is based. I don't know whether you, you have something else. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for everything, Benedetta. Uh, we are really grateful at HCSS for your uh, valuable contribution uh, to the IDCSS 22. Um, I believe uh, we don't have any more questions. Uh, and uh, you've already been really generous with your time. Uh, once again, uh, we really appreciate the expert insight into GDPR. And uh, we really hope uh, to host uh, your lecture next year as well. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, so uh, thank you to everyone for your attention, for listening to me and for inviting me. It's been really a pleasure. Thank you so much, Benedetta. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you. Bye bye.